Daryl. Good morning. What's up, Brad? Let's go. Oh. How you How doing? How are you this morning? It's uh, it's good to be here. It's good weather in Vegas. Uh, Absolutely. I'm uh, ready when we finish our call. Go get some exercise. Hence my uh, USC garb. I hear you. Um, I hear you. I went there in the eighties and, uh, I think I've been just slightly uh, brainwashed. So I still buy the, uh, the attire, um, <laughs> nothing wrong. I with don't, it. I don't know how that works. I think it's the band and whatever the band plays, uh, that the music plays over and over in your head. You just, they, I don't know. It's something like buy a USC stuff. So, I hear you. <laughs> um, so I have a few, few items, uh, maybe a lot of them. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if you knew this or not, but I actually wanted to go to USC and, uh, and didn't. So, uh, I was playing baseball and, and they were one of the best, better baseball programs back oh, in yeah. the uh, late eighties. So, uh, anyway, didn't, didn't happen. Of course, sports didn't right. happen for my college. That's, so, but that's uh, funny. And, kind of uh, respect so for you. I, I wanted to go to UCLA, but I didn't get in. So, um, mm. I ended up at the better school, uh, across, across town. So uh, that, that's the way that, it worked out. That was, uh, <laughs> an amazing opportunity. So, yeah. um, Anyhow, let's uh, let's talk this morning um, because it's been on my mind uh, rather uh, frequently about uh, cash flow. Because having lots of cash flow conversations with uh, with uh, our uh, catapult members, and you know we 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 look at financial statements. I think I I, I and and uh, the, the my colleagues at Catapult run a little different program than what people are used to, and in, in uh, the uh, coaching space. I think we we run definitely more on the advisory side, and as advising, um, I think it's important to look at financial statements. And um, I think that uh, people in this space who uh, fail to do that uh, are really failing their their clients. Uh, the numbers, uh, provided they're done accurately, paint a picture of what's happened. Uh, and I think they paint a path uh, to a future uh, that, uh, if uh, properly analyzed uh, and put in the appropriate context, uh, derives better results. And I can't think of an entrepreneur that I know that is not interested in achieving a better result uh, for their their company, for themselves, their employees, their families, and, and the like. So I'm looking for um, long-term sustainability. I'm looking for uh, building enterprise value. I'm looking to build uh, where the entrepreneur, uh, Daryl, has a, I, I call it has a life. Of course, they have a life, but uh, meaning that they're not under pressure all the time. And, and I think that's, uh, that's useful. Yeah. Uh, as, you, as you know, our, our typical Catapult member is uh, an owner, founder, operator running a business, uh, usually between $5 million uh, and a hundred million, and of course, there's variations on either side. But they're they're not a brand new startup, uh, and, and they're generally working on professionalizing their their company, their management, uh, their uh, systems, and, and and et cetera, and trying to build uh, repeatable processes that uh, it, it really engender long term results. So in that, um, we. We spend uh, quite a bit of time looking at financials, and um, I know you 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 have a degree in business and have spent a lot of time looking at financials. So uh, you're very familiar with the three financial statement model, um, and you've heard me uh, probably more times than you care to talk about <laughs> income statement, balance sheet, and then the often overlooked one is the statement of cash flows. Yeah. Uh, and so interestingly enough, the statement of cash flows is maybe the most important document we ever really look at because it shows the effect on cash over a period of time. And uh, that period of time uh, is for is for that, that same income statement that you're looking at if it's done correctly. And as you know, it's really hard to operate your business on inventory and it's hard to operate it on accounts receivable. You actually right. need cash to pay your employees. They, they don't want your product uh, <laughs> that's on the shelf and uh, you got to make payroll uh, in some companies every week. Yeah. So yeah. we focus on cash is important. Um, so uh, the number that I'm interested on that statement um, is cash flow from operations. And, and so Cash flow from operations is defined 
is the basically the change in cash uh, as a result of the operating activities that occur over a period, could be a month, quarter, year, whatever it happens to be. I think the longer the period we run, the more relevant the data gets. There's less uh, like wobble, definitely less seasonality and, and the like. But uh, important is cash. The generation of cash is the business generating cash. So many times there is a... Uh, a strong look at the the income statement and there it's like i'm making profit but are you turning that profit that accrual net income does that turn to cash and how quickly so one of the ratios that i'm looking uh, at uh, these days is the cash flow from operations over the accrual net profit I, I know that's maybe not the normal ratio analysis that people look at. Uh, maybe it is. Uh, but to me, it's somewhat of an efficiency ratio. And what I mean by that is, is that over a period of time, we should be matching closer and closer that the delta between the top number and the bottom number should be getting closer and closer. There should be a, a very little uh, gap between those. Mm. And what I'm looking for is how quickly do we get our invoices out? How quickly do we convert work in progress to that invoice? How quickly do we get it out? And then how quickly do we take from that invoice that's been sent out or whatever and convert that into check, ACH, whatever the, the soup du jour payment methodology is these days? How quickly does it convert to cash? Because that is really the only really useful resource at the end of the day, right? Otherwise, um, you're backfilling the, those gaps with lines of credit, uh, things like factoring or flooring or any of those type of financial instruments. And while they're available, I don't think they're ideal. The best place to fund your business is through profits and the conversion of that profit to cash. So uh, it, it's been a focus. It's a focus of mine. Um, and uh, I, I've seen plenty of businesses show cruel net profit and not have any money. Uh, right. That's not a good scenario, uh, especially if that's a long-term scenario. Short-term scenarios where that's a problem we can usually fix with some finance instrument. Mm -hmm. So um, anyhow, that's uh, that's been the focus. Uh, the closer I see uh, cash flow from operations matching uh, that income line, uh, the better I feel. Um, <laughs> and hopefully the better the entrepreneur feels. Right, right. So, so I got some, I got some. Yeah, follow go ahead. I, I'm, uh, I've been talking a lot and uh, I, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a good thing. Maybe not. No, it but... was good. So uh, what I heard, and I, I really appreciate this because Again, it is one of those financial, we, we think the balance sheet all the time. We think, you know, we look at ARs, we look at right. APs, we look at the PL, of course, for sure. We like to compare quarter over quarter, month over month, year over right. year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but let's talk about some of the areas that uh, as entrepreneurs, we, um, you said the, the delta, can you talk about the two numbers that you're comparing when you say you look at the, you're looking at that delta getting closer and closer? R right. So. Look, uh, in many in many companies, uh, uh, your, yours probably included, uh, you do some work, then you send a bill. Okay? The customer uh, then receives the bill. There's some period of time uh, between the processing and then you, uh, if everything works well, get paid, right? So uh, <laughs> and <Ideally. laughs> that, there's a timing delay, right? So right. we have this working capital uh, dilemma that, uh, occurs in 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 all businesses, and it really does put a limitation on growth, because you are funding uh, generally payroll and oftentimes materials or subcontractors or like to achieve uh, the result product or service for your 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 client, and then you send a bill and then you wait. Okay, all right. So uh, you've spent a bunch of money. Um, Maybe spent fifty cents on on the dollar bill. Uh, if if you've done it well, uh, if you're tight uh, on margin, maybe you've spent seventy five cents on on the dollar bill. Been there. Um, and 
that gap uh, only can be funded for so long. Yeah. All right. So in certain companies, I've seen where they're really slow getting the billing out. All right. So not only do they have to wait for their customer, they're waiting for their own staff to process the bill and then in turn send it out. And then they have the whatever the customer's process is. Uh, which often includes, hey, can you send me, can you rebuild this? So uh, you didn't spell something correctly or right. something. Right. So, um, okay. So there's a gap when we report uh, on financial statements and we report generally on what's called an accrual method. Um, we report uh, things that it's called like unbilled uh, work in progress. Well, that that's that's revenue, but that's not revenue that's turned to cash just yet. And then we report uh, the revenue that is billed, which ends up on the balance sheet as accounts receivable. Both accounts receivable and unbilled WIP are included in most uh, financial uh, ratio analysis of working capital. Okay. But as I explained earlier, um, without some finance instrument, it's really hard to spend on build whip and accounts receivable i don't really like the classic working um capital definition of current assets minus current liabilities mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's only so many current assets uh, that work for paying those current liabilities yeah so yeah. anyhow the focus on the cash generation and and this i think also applies to m a activity um you, you've heard in in mergers and acquisitions people often refer to this EBITDA calculation right yep EBITDA you hear EBITDA and you know what's an EBITDA right so <laughs> um, it's not a sandwich uh, right. a new kind of sandwich but um <laughs> you know that's the earnings right before interest taxes depreciation and amortization which is a whole mouthful of of terminology but what really matters I mean when we're buying something, a business, for example, aren't we really buying the cash flow of that business? Right. And so uh, why, why are we looking at all those adjustments? I, I think the reason we look at all those adjustments is the number becomes larger. And then when we apply a multiple to it in a multiple of earnings, we end up with a bigger number. And so the buyer's spending more, the seller's getting more. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that's a good thing if you're a buyer. So I think it makes it much more difficult. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Yeah. So anyhow, cash flow. Cash flow is um what we need to focus on. Yeah. So and and the, it it helps us in so many ways, Daryl, which is it helps us look at profitability in a different light. It also makes us think about how of our systems are working, right? Mm. How how is our project management? How's yes. our accounting department? How's yep. the collection department within the accounting? How are our policies? What kind of credit policy do we say? So there's so many variables that work into this calculation. And I think focusing on that, that conversion to cash helps us recognize the issues and bring forward then better policies, procedures, methodologies, whatever you want to call it to produce better results. Because we're now focused on the number that matters. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I've been also having a ton of conversation lately on this, this topic of improving profitability through cutting costs. And I don't think it works very well. Because for, for a short window, it can, but it, you can't cut your way to, you, you can't cut your way to profit. I mean, you, you can cut waste and, and overspend, right? But you can't cut your way to a successful growth business, right? A high right. Growth and, business. And, and the problem is, is that most of the entrepreneurs that I know, they, they don't run these, uh, excuse the term, fat enterprises, right? They're, they're, they're not generally um, over, overspending in a million ways, having a ton of waste. There's probably some waste. Yeah. Um, there's probably some things they could buy better uh, in their organization. But Generally, um, once they fix those, uh, that's that's over, right? Wrap, right. So yeah, so that's <laughs> it's done, and so I don't find it to be a sustainable model of cost cutting. Understand. The understand. only way to get it is on uh, per unit revenue growth. Mm -hmm. So 
I think what's define, happened. Def, def, define, that re- define that really quick, per unit revenue growth. Define that. Right. So we look at revenue, uh, which is you know the total sales of a company. And that's relevant. That's a good number to look at. That's important. But I think where there is a potential gap uh, that exists today is that While revenue may look good, profitability may be squeezed because we've had a period of costs, tremendous rising costs Mm -hmm. in business. And uh, we just went through the pandemic and then there was some government uh, incentives placed out in the marketplace that we had uh, inflation at a much higher rate than we've experienced over, over, you know, modern time, I guess. Uh, it seems to have abated, uh, but the costs, uh, the, the the rate of inflation has abated, but the costs haven't dramatically abated. Right. And so we have a cost structure of both labor. Everybody's getting paid more and, and rightfully so. It, it's expensive to live. Uh, the cost of living has gone up. People need to be paid well for their, their work. Mm-hmm. But the business owner, particularly in this small and mid-sized business category, I don't know that they've kept pace on their side of pricing. And so when I talk about revenue in, and then I talk about it in per unit, um, you know, we have a, a, a pen, you know, we, we, we could sell a lot of these, but if the unit metrics on it uh, is not right, uh, we're, we're not getting the incremental benefit of the sale the way we should be. Right. All right. right. So um, there's, there's like a, a ton of analysis and, and I like to look at numbers and I think you know that I'm kind of a numbers oriented individual that you uh, are, which is probably <laughs> saying that lightly, but it's because the numbers tell a story. Yeah. And that story, if we look at it uh, objectively helps us run the organization better or profitably uh, and uh, puts less strain on resources. Yeah. And yeah. so the, there's, there's probably some method to my math madness that, that I think yields really great results. And I think it's much easier sometimes from the outside to objectively look at it. That's what I do for the members of uh, the Catapult Group's company. That's where I spend my time is looking at numbers, having conversations, finding ways that we can optimize. And usually those optimizations are not coming from cost cutting. Um, the, The entrepreneur's already done that. It comes from proper estimating your labor and material costs. It comes from proper margining. It comes from the understanding of your cost structure. And it also comes from properly differentiating your service or product in the marketplace so that you can earn a non-commodity fee for it. Yes, yes. (laughs) And... I mean, that's probably a whole other conversation for another day. Yeah. Um, but having a service or product that you can actually articulate, and that's a, another area where you can articulate that difference uh, in, in the marketplace to a potential customer, to an existing customer, that yes, this costs more on, on price, but it's better value because of these three things or whatever that happens to be. And it's actually going to either make you more money, cost you less money overall, <laughs> reduce time. It's going to have some to benefit result, right, to you, right. right? That's different from what everybody else is offering. And it's not just more expensive. Right. So uh, we have to do that. So it's, it's like this combination of all these factors that yields over time a profitable enterprise. And by putting all of that together and having those systems and having the analysis, not only do you create great profit, but you create better enterprise value for the owner. Yeah. You know, Brad, there's a comment I'd love for you get, to get your thoughts on this. There's some people on the outside listening in who, you know, th- there's this school of thought there. They think companies that are just always chasing, making more money, making more money, they're somehow evil, bad manipulating the market. I believe, and I think you do as well, and I'd love for just to hear a couple of thoughts from you, but a profitable business 
paying attention to what you're talking about today, paying attention to profit, paying attention to cash flow is not just good for the entrepreneur. It's good for the employees of that firm. And it's in most cases best for its customers and clients so that the enterprise can remain the valuable resource that the customers expected sure. it to be, that the employees needed their livelihood to come from. And so a lot of employees don't see it that way. Not a lot. I don't want to say that. But there are some people who would argue, ah, why are we always talking about profit? Because it's important to everybody. <laughs> well, right. So, I mean, all good things come from profit. Profit is the money that is available to have raises. It's the available to provide mm -hmm. research and development. It's available to have an adequately staffed company to provide excellence in customer service and yeah. operational excellence along the way. Yeah. It provides for new equipment. <laughs> when necessary so yeah. it's it's it, it without that we the companies exist on borrowed uh funds and they can do that for a while but that actually truncates margin and profitability as well so really you need a profitable enterprise that's self-funding over time and that is good i think for everyone mm -hmm. and customers may think they want to whittle uh prices down uh on a on their their uh their vendors and maybe to a certain extent they do but they still want them to operate profitably so that they can be around uh innovative able to offer great service for the next project or job or yeah. product whatever it happens to be right yeah it, it it really does matter and uh sustainability matters okay. running at a razor a razor thin margin all the time uh, leaves no room for really anything. Right. Except so, stress. right. So in order to play employees <laughs> better, which I think is great, I think that's the way employees make money. Like the company needs to make money. That's right. Um, and hopefully they have their compensation systems aligned such that the employees benefit when the company does well. That's right. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Super important topic. Very important. Um, statement of cash flows the the sort of the even even evil stepchild of the three right everyone loves the PL and the bank the balance sheet and often the statement of cash flows gets left out but uh i love how you said it you know you can't you can't fund the business on uh, outstanding ar you can't fund the business on whip which <laughs> work in progress yeah. that yeah. stuff doesn't convert your team's not looking for crypto and you know baseball cards as a subsidy <laughs> right they they want money they want dinero and ducats at the end of the pay period so and um you're right that, the, that, the worst... that's right uh the supermarket is not going to take your accounts receivable for uh for your uh you know nope. your head of lettuce there or anything that's just not going to work that's right so that's right. um <laughs> yeah it, it is interesting and i see many businesses present financial statements without the cash flow statement uh, that never made any sense to me, but I can tell you that the people that I work with, uh, they're they're producing cash flow statements now, yeah. um, and they're looking at them. For for the person listening, just uh, on the other side of this, does QuickBooks and the traditional accounting software produce this statement of cash flow? It does. Yeah, it does. Box? It's actually a, a, a resident report in the QuickBooks Online platform, so it's it's not fancy. It's standard. It's standard, it just needs right. to be looked at. Gotcha. Gotcha. So there you right. have it. If you're listening, just check with your accounting software. <laughs> yeah, it's it's there. It, it'll it actually do it at a click of a button. The key, Perfect. though, uh, Daryl, is make sure that you're matching the period of time. Um, mm. that So the, the, the income statement runs for a period of time, a month, a quarter, a year, et cetera. The statement of cash flow should match whatever that period is. And because the balance sheet, when you look at it, is just a snapshot on one day, just yes. a day. So yes. the um, that that statement of cash flows is kind of the document that kind of reconciles, shows what the the changes of uh, an effect to cash of over that period of of time that that operation went on, mm -hmm. and it all ties out. So the income statement ties out, the balance sheet ties out, and the statement of cash flow ties out. You have all three of those. And in a properly uh, done accounting system, you you really have some great information to look at. 